Yeah. Also, if you go back to the to the seventies, you know the the SP five hundred, you know, didn't do anything for ten years. It basically were range yes. bound between uh, one hundred and sixty, uh, one hundred and and sixty. So, for ten years, nothing happened. You know, it just went up and down uh, two or three times, and then it started to climb higher. But during that period, you know, gold went from thirty to roughly what is it, nine hundred or so. Uh, so, if you measure the the SPX. Uh, in gold, back to then, you know, you have lost, uh, as as Patrick said, you know, a tremendous amount of purchasing power. Even though, after ten years, you started to see higher highs in the SPX, you, you have lost a uh, one decade worth of uh, of capital, basically. So I agree. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and you look at these charts throughout history, and you couple it with the fact that commodities were super cheap, like the cheapest they've ever been, in like 2020. Um, the fact that if you like even interest rates pre-2022 were the cheapest in 5,000 years. So it's like, where else could, where else could they go? You know what I mean? Like, well, and, and this, this, this is where technical analysis comes in yes. guys as well, because if you're watching this and you're fairly new to technical analysis, um, from a fundamental point of view, people have been arguing that, you know, commodities are undervalued versus the S and P for years and years and years. I've heard this for so many years. And uranium as well. I mean, okay, let's go back, I don't know, five, six, seven years with uranium. The fundamental case was was great. I mean, the world needs uranium. We've got, you know, a warming climate. We've got policies around the world to decarbonize and it's staring everybody in the face. But what that fundamental argument does not tell you is when to invest in uranium, when to invest in commodities. If you'd invested five years ago, you'd have been sat there watching your losses pile up month after month, year after year, and you'd have, you'd have been wiped out sort of 80% of your, your nav by, by, by the time it got down to the bottom. So fundamental discussions are great for reasoning why the markets will eventually go in a particular direction. We're doing the same at the moment for gold and silver. There's a lot of fundamental reasons why gold and silver and, and uh, cryptocurrencies are going to you know, do extremely well over the coming years. But technical analysis, when you look at the price chart and you analyze it in the way that all of us guys here do tells you when to enter that trade it tells you when the scientific evidence the weight of evidence on that technical chart has delivered its verdict and from that point what was resistance is now support at that point you're entering the new bullish trend that everyone's been talking about for the last five or ten years and you can save it save yourself all that time all that opportunity cost if you spend a little bit of time just getting to understand how to analyze the chart I'm I'm glad you brought that point up, Kevin. It's like you have a copy of my my notes here because I wanted to kind of, and this is where it's really going to get interesting. I'm I'm presuming. Um, the question is, and it dovetails off the, off of what you just said, is how do you know when to buy when there's asymmetry, i.e., a stock or an asset is so depressed, has been down in the dumps for so long, unwanted, unloved, versus buying on breakouts if you ah, buy on breakouts was, that's the, the yeah the conundrum is you lose some of that upside if you just wait for the breakout but at the same time you're taking a risk by buying something that's just purely asymmetric and just unloved so i'm gonna i'm gonna let uh, the engineers here um we're gonna start with casper um casper what's your take on this do you uh your does your philosophy kind of do you buy on uh, do you buy do you buy in terms of asymmetry or do you wait for breakouts to buy? Typically, I wait for breakouts, but I do it over not only if you let's say uranium, for example, I'd only I don't only look at URA and just go from there. I also compare it to the to the underlying commodity, in this case, the uranium, yeah, the uranium spot price, but also against the overall markets to see if if we have more and more ratios aligned up together and just to confirm uh my take on the markets and and uh, what I did on the uranium back in 2020 was actually the breakout between URA and the uranium the uranium spot price um, and that was my trigger to go long. Um, so I did I didn't buy the bottom in March 2020, which I know Andy did. For example, he bought the the massive dump there, but I uh, I bought the the uh, my confirmation at least you know six months later or so. So I'm trying to to gather. It's like a big uh, it's like a big puzzle, right? And I need more pieces in the puzzle to 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 get my 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 full picture and you will never get the full picture because then you would make money every time so but uh, when you get to having you know a, a almost complete picture you have an idea of uh, where we might be going and uh, and yeah i'm trying to to do it across 
multiples and also measuring in, measuring in gold and so on. I do I do that as well. So it's it's a yeah multi ratio analysis. I would say that's how that's how I I deal with, with things. And then I try to keep it as simple as possible with a very few trend lines. And uh, when they break, I know that's that's my go to to invest into that that sector or that uh, commodity. So yeah. Gotcha, Andy. Uh, what do you th uh, what do you think here? Asymmetry or breakouts? Or a little bit of well, both? I, so I look for alignment. I know it sounds a little bit different, but uh, I look for a pattern that's wedging up most of the time. And I'm going to say that I'm a lot more aggressive than maybe other people are in terms of taking on what is perceivably risk, but maybe not perceivably to me. So what I try to line is, here, I'll show you. I'll show you what like a, we'll do like a CRV index. All right. And I'll yank this up here real quick and I'll show you kind of how I do it um, and what I did. So when, when I look at like a, the CRV index here, um, I look for the cycles and the cycle here, this is an expansionary phase of real estate. We were entering an expansionary phase of real estate in this era through here in 18, 19, it was coming up. Uh, generally speaking, in history, that's when inflation comes. And what I was looking for is an alignment of very cheap assets. That's your your asymmetry there, uh, which we had in this bottom of 2020. We had the symmetry across the board. Yeah. Oil went to an anomaly level uh, where it went negative. And when you price that against anything, it's just an anomaly in history. It just goes right off the page. Uh, so generally what happens is they're going to they're going to do some sort of stimulus if they get a slowdown so what i was looking for is we've got the three hump pullback so that 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 usually occurs in a lot of these uh consolidation zones this is your consolidation period what i did is i said we're in a consolidation period i recognize that i get it uh, a lot of the times at these market bottoms they like to do stimulus which is inflationary but they did stimulus at the same time that we're in an expansionary phase of real estate, which is going to just blow up the real estate market to the upside. So the first asset that responds in that type of condition is generally gold and silver. So that'll go first. Uh, that's what I was in. And then I rotated over into uh, all of the oil and energy plays in September, October of 2020. Uh, so that's where I rotated all that money in uh, because of the ratios. Now, we didn't have breakouts in some of it. We definitely did not have breakouts in oil. We definitely did not have breakouts in, in gold, but I'll just give you one thing I looked at. Uh, SM Energy was my, the thing I purchased and I priced it against uh, the ratio of natural gas. And I bought it in the corner here, right where that, that orange arrow or circle is. Um, we had the falling wedge. We had all the downside ripped out of it. And I said, you know what? The downside risk is pretty minimal here. Uh, some of these companies have debt. Yes, there was risk that they could go bankrupt, uh, but that was your opportunity because anything that had debt was going to get sold for pennies on the dollar. So you had the opportunity to buy some of these companies uh, at pennies at the dollar. So one of them was SM. Uh, I also saw here's crew energy in relationship to natural gas. That also had that type of falling wedge in the corner there. And that's where I could buy it, where I'm looking for an alignment uh, across multiple um, multiple areas where you get the ratios blown out to the downside, which is oil and that gas at that time. Uh, then you've got the symmetry on your side. Then you've got the falling wedges that are all wedging up to a corner. Uh, and then you've got the stimulus that they that they printed. I'm like, oh, this is going to be inflationary. You've got the expansionary phase of real estate, which is inflationary. Uh, and then you looked at like the 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 ten year yield, and that just went to the downside. Uh, the ten year yield and the movements of the ten year yield is what rotates money from asset to asset. So when inflation comes in the system, stimulus and expansionary phase of real estate, my I, my thought was uh, that that interest rates were going to rise. If interest rates were to rise, which we're at blowout bottoms, like there's, you're not going to go, you know, I, I didn't think you were going to go further to the downside. So if we we're going to move up in the interest rates, it was going to cause a rotation of money from stocks and other asset classes into commodities. Uh, so what I saw this as 
is I said, you know what, this is the the generational once in a millennial opportunity <laughs> where oil is trading negative. It's 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 coming back. Um, we've got all these in the corners here. The equities are cheap to the commodity. The commodity is cheap to gold. The commodity is cheap to stocks. There's no more downside here. So I bought a bunch of oil and nat gas at the bottom in September of 2020, and I'm still holding those positions today uh, because I think that the rotation of money will continue to happen because of inflation. It's going to put pressure on the bond market to sell off. Interest rates will rise. And when you price equities in terms of interest rates, they, use, they do net present value calculations of growth uh, to today. And when you use a higher interest rate, the net present value of, of stocks is lower than it is with a lower interest rate. So if I were to like do a big picture view of this, and I'm, I'm choosing both, symmetry uh, is the most important to me, uh, and then the breakout is the validation of it. But we had a 40-year decline in interest rates that pot, that basically piled money all over in the stock market and bond market. It's all over there. So then the question is, what is your downside risk if nobody owns this crap? Like, it just got sold and there's fear in the market. So I'm like, well, now here's my opportunity to change my life. So I, I took it. Uh, so I would say symmetry is, it has to be there. Technical analysis is a validation of your thoughts about symmetry. And, and a validation that the symmetry is changing in your favor. So what I noticed is market condition forced everything, 40-year decline in interest rates, forced it all over in bonds and stocks. We had our capitulation bottom. It started to come on up. Interest rates are going to cause the rotation of money into the sectors that I just invested in. And I'm going to stay long in this thing. So symmetry has to be there. Technical analysis is the validation that the money's rotating uh, for it. So I, I don't know. I think you need both to some degree because I use technical analysis for my entry point. Uh, but I also had symmetry behind my back for the valuation. So you have to have the valuation period. Otherwise, I won't be there. There's no way I would go and buy tech stocks right now because they're overvalued to heck. We're in the wrong market condition and you're just going to get crushed, in my opinion. There's too much risk there. So, th I mean, that's how I would answer it. Uh, and that's my uh, approach of what I did. Uh, and I still think this is going to rotate into commodities continually. Yeah. So, so essentially, you, you don't just look at asymmetry myopically, like naively. Like it's got a, it's just one component within a series of criteria um, that you've already outlined there. And I guess that's also what uh, Casper was kind of alluding to as well. You have to have the symmetry. If you don't have the symmetry, you're taking on too much risk for the reward. So I don't it's know. It's necessary, the, but it's not sufficient. Maybe, yeah. Yes, it, it is absolutely necessary, but it's not the only thing I look at. Hey, Andy, uh, okay. could I could I throw a question? What sure. what would you have done if if um, it would have continued going down there or sideways? When would you give up and say, okay, <clears throat> this, this something's off? So let's say you bought in twenty twenty the bottom, you picked it, and hindsight looks great. But let's say it would have kept going down and it would have went sideways for five six years. Let's say they didn't inject enough money or whatever narrative you want to put in there, and the markets say. We're still meh. So when do you, when you call it off? How how long do you hold all this stuff? I I, I would hold it for multiple years. I'd hold it for even four or five years if I had hey, to well, um to if, if and accumulate that bottom. Yes. Well, that's important uh, just to, like to the mention. 19, the nineteen sixties uh, that yeah. occurred in the nineteen sixties. Um, but what made me a lot more confident this this roll around is the stimulus that they put in the system, and they literally sent checks to people. I'm like. You can't do this during an expansionary phase of real estate. It's going to blow the housing market up. And we are going to, I mean, the inflation is going to be pretty great from this. That was my viewpoint. And that's yes. why I took the 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 positions I did and when I did it, because I thought they, they like line this up too good for it. Uh, now, if you didn't have the stimulus, then that would be a totally different uh, read there because I wouldn't be as sure with the, the, forcefulness of the inflation impact. Uh, so that's that's really what pushed me over. So I'm a, I'm a hybrid. I look at what causes the movements in the system, what's going to cause the money to rotate. And that's kind of how I viewed it. And I'd use technical analysis to say, yeah, this is a falling wedge. Um, where I could have gotten hurt is that the falling wedge existed in 2019. But 2020 was the blowout down crash. 
uh, and I was lucky enough not to be there yet. Wow. I, it was, it was, there was, there was luck there uh, involved because I was looking at it. And I'm like, ah, it's, I, I don't know. And then I saw that, that blow down, like the, everybody got afraid and the fear. I was like, Oh, screw this. I'm so in like Flynn because it, it was the fear that brought these prices to what I think are just ludicrous levels. Uh, and then the, the ratio on oil went negative against gold and, and it blew out to, you know, infinity. I'm like, how the heck is this going to happen? I also know that when you go to the downside on a ratio that most likely it's going to go to the upside in the opposite direction, probably further than what it did before. Uh, the limits, uh, roughly 30 to one is like a limit kind of of what I've got for a cheap ratio for oil to gold. The bottom end is like six to one, somewhere on that range. So one ounce gold to six barrels of oil. Um, we went to like infinity on the downside. And I thought, oh, this is on the other side, this is going to have to go below six at some point because they just completely screwed the whole supply side of this by shutting the economy down, by doing all this. I just thought it was like, man, this just seems clear to me uh, that something's going to happen now with the interest rates where they're at. Um, I think the symmetry is shifting to more like precious metals because if we have an energy crisis and you've got all of this debt problem, uh, the next the next thing for me naturally is to go migrate towards precious metals uh, because in the 1970s, it was the same setup. Yeah, and well, take, take a look at the precious metal miners as well, Andy. Look at the junior miners. Yep. If you're looking, if you're looking yep. for asymmetry and a market that is historically um, incredibly stretched in the way that you've been describing there, just take a look at some of the junior right. silver and gold miners. I mean, they are ridiculously undervalued. But um, I'll do so devil's they, advocate. They could, they could get cheaper. They, they could get, could cheaper, get cheaper, cheaper for longer. They could so, get cheaper for longer. Patrick's that's, right. That's, that's can. What, yeah. if you get, but if you, if you get that spike event that Andy's talking about and a panic capitulation with a wick on that candle, then that is your entry point. As soon as you start to see a, a, a wick developing on that candle after a panic capitulation event, if you're wanting to, to take advantage at that particular point, rather than waiting for the breakout, rather than waiting for the confirmation, then that's the time to do it. Wait until people talk about blood in the streets. And it's it's not always, I'm gonna say it's not always easy at the time to have the, the courage to go out there and do what Andy did. It's one thing to identify it on a chart and say, look, this looks ridiculous, but it's another thing to put your money where your mouth is and go out there and, and buy these shares that everyone's telling you is like, you know, you wouldn't shouldn't touch them with a 10-foot pole. But you know, being brave and knowing what you're doing, knowing what you're talking about, and spotting that on a technical chart. So asymmetry can be incredible for opportunity if you know what you're looking for, if you can spot the signs. But Patrick's also right. If, you know, if something's just because something's cheap, doesn't mean it's a good time to buy it because it can get much cheaper for much longer. And I can, I've pointed that out before with some cryptocurrencies. There were, don't ask me the names of them because there's thousands of funny things, but there are some that fell 80%, 85% uh, a couple of years ago, uh, 18 months ago, whatever it was. And they they broke out of a declining trend line. Okay, so fall of eighty or eighty five percent break out above the, a declining trend line. What happened after that? Fell another eighty percent. Okay, so just because something breaks out, so just because something's cheap and it's fallen eighty five percent and it's broken out of an inclining trend line or declining trend line, does not mean that's a good time to buy it. Okay, so you know it, there's there's more than just the fact that it's cheap that needs to be considered here or more than the fact that it looks cheap. Oh, yeah, sorry, you're on, you're on the mute then. Oh, sorry, guys. Um, no, uh, really good points there, Kevin. Um, I, I think essentially what you're what you're saying is that, you know, the, the easiest way to lose 99% is to lose 90% and another 90% on top of it, <laughs> right? So, um, Patrick, is there anything else you want to add? Um, I, I don't think you got a turn here to answer the question. Uh, I don't know. I've been speaking all over the place, but it just you got to be careful on what was the question again? Maybe I could try to um, asymmetry it. versus uh, bu yes. buying on asymmetry versus breakouts. Yes, exactly. Well, look, to have enough trend, guys, higher lows. So already you've moved 50, 60 percent off the bottom. I, I don't want to be hero. The fastest, mm -hmm. longest, powerful moves, they happen with the momentum, it's it's all about energy. It goes down, there's a crazy move up. People, oh, how come you didn't buy the bottom? That's fine. Let I'm a patient guy. I'll let it build up. And after that, once that 10-year epic base, like June of 2019, when gold broke out, 
on the weekly, the monthly, the quarterly, and the semestral candle close, that's the time you have a, where the risk is low. It's like low risk because you're, and nobody's talking about gold or inflation back in June of 2019. That's when you have a multi-year run where gold went um, from, I don't know, 1350 all the way to 2000. That's, that's the lion's share. That's me waiting for my prey to be really weak. I'm not going to try to jump on it, trying to get the prey. I'm going to let it stumble, get tired, and I'll get in at that low risk event, supersize my position, con control it with the sell stops, everything. If I'm wrong, I'm out. And then I ride that. The spike for me, the spike down for me is one, it's an evidence. It's not a buy point. It's just a point of evidence. Okay, the spike happened. It's moving up. It's doing a higher low. Okay, it's coiling. People don't believe it yet. I get in lower. I get in higher. I can make as much money as the guy buying down at the dip with less risk. And that's yeah, so about that's risk of that's imagine something that people do not understand. Yes. That's a very, very important point there. Because, it, again, if you're watching this and you're fairly new to technical chart analysis and buying stocks and shares, critical, critical, critical that you understand sound risk and money management. And that means, for example, exactly what Patrick just said, you can buy at a higher level, but because of your stop loss, your entry point and your profit limit, your risk to reward ratio is just as good and sometimes even better than if you buy lower down at a at a at, a, at that point that we were just talking about because you you have to estimate your realistic next sort of stopping point and that's usually a point of horizontal resistance so you have to identify on the chart where your resistance levels are because you don't know how long the price is going to stop at that resistance level it could pull back and consolidate for two or three years just like well uranium mm -hmm. classic yeah. example it just did that look at the ura chart Look at what happened when it came out of the lows in 2020. Great run, brilliant run, hit horizontal resistance. What happened? Pulled back for two years. If you want to be in that for two years and give back 60% of what you just of what you just gained, well, obviously not. So that's why you use risk and money management and use that risk calculation tool to estimate the stopping point. You, you exit when you're stretched from the moving average. If you're wondering when to exit a trade, okay. Here's another top tip from, from me and Pat. How do you know when to exit a trade? Identify horizontal overhead resistance levels, but not just that, but look at your distance from moving average indicator. Many charts, you can look back in history and you can see this up and down, up and down distance from moving average. And as time passes, you can see it builds support and resistance levels on the distance from moving average. So you can use that tool and you can look at that stock and say, oh, Every time it gets 110% above the moving average, it tends to pull back. So you then go to your price chart, go to your moving average, your three-year moving average, measure 110%, and nine times out of 10, guess what? It coincides with a horizontal uh, wall of resistance. So you're confirming that that's where the price is going to stop and pour, at least pause. So you exit your trade at that point, wait to see how stock reacts at that point. The chances are it's going to pull back you don't know how far, you don't know how long, but you re-enter when it gets back above that horizontal level, or if it develops a declining wedge, you re-enter. Do you, do you want to show an example, Kevin? Like, give well, an example. Can, yeah, I can show you on the URA chart. Um, let me just pull but, up. Andy, while Kevin says that up, Andy, you do buy on breakouts. You add, or you you just you don't try to climb the bottom. Another, <clears throat> there's another thing that I do. Um, so let's say you're coming into a corner of a of a falling wedge. Uh, you're seeing other stocks in the sector break to the upside. You've seen other commodity sectors breaking to the upside. I'm like, okay, there's a high probability this is going to break to the upside. You can take a decent position and and as it goes and it breaks out, you add into that strength. So you cost average into the position. You buy it in the tip, buy, 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 buy. It breaks your, your trend line and then you dump into that strength. Uh, so you're buying into the, the, the confirmation of the breakout. So you can get a cost average position. Now, if it doesn't break out, you can say, you know what, if it breaks below my the 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 tip of this falling wedge, you could sell out of it. But most of the times, if everything's moving up, you can get a false breakdown and then a slingshot higher. So I, I usually hold on if the market conditions look good. But that's one way to reduce risk, cost average in and then pile in on the breakout. So this is this is the Global X uh, URA chart, okay? And very clear um, technical pattern here. It's a sort of a, a cup pattern, as many people refer to it as, or a, an arc. So geometrically speaking, it's an arc pattern. But what you can see, there's a number of um, classic 
um, points on this chart. And one of them is this breakout that took, took place back in 2020 here. It formed a base over a, a number of years here and you had a very clear breakout and a back test. That there um, combined with um, other technical evidence, we've got the 12 month and the 36 month moving average here. There's a little cluster of evidence there. You've broken above key moving averages, you've broken above a declining resistance line. There's also going to be um, a horizontal support and resistance line or a pivot line in there. And you can see that the sell off, the classic capitulation candle with a spike to the downside. That's what I was talking about before. And I think everybody here will recognize that um, bullish candle when the price closes way, way above the low point for the, uh, for the month. And then you've got the confirmation from the breakout here. Now, this is where I entered the uranium play. I was tracking the formation of a little bullish uh, wedge in here. You can just about see it, this little bullish flag. And that's where I entered it. It would have been around about $11. And I, like Ark Andy with, uh, with his commodities, I've just, to a large extent, stayed in this trade um, with the conviction of, of you know, what I'm seeing with the uranium sector. But you know, this this pullback and consolidation that's been going on since um, the end of 2021 here, so nearly two years, you know, a year and a half. Again, another classic technical uh, bullish pattern here, a bullish uh, wedge pattern with a breakout. Now, you know, what I'm talking about here is estimating with the uh, technical analysis tools um, just how to use the distance from moving average. So this indicator here, this top one, is the distance from moving average, the distance from the three year moving average. So what you can see with this particular stock is that it has historically in the previous run been as high as, and I'm just gonna have to move something on my screen here. It's been as high as about 90% above the moving average and a reasonable target. There's a couple of, couple of peaks here at around about 70% above the moving average. So you just take your measuring tool, uh, grab your, your price range measuring tool, estimate where the three year moving average is likely to be in a few months time. And you, again, you just have to uh, project the, the green three year moving average moving up. And so you set your tool, move up to around about 90% above the moving average. And hey, presto, where does that end up? Like I said, horizontal wall of resistance. You can see the price action came down, it tested it tested it again, broke below it, back tested it. So you've got a wall of resistance there. And the fact that the distance from moving average calculation of a move up to somewhere around 70 or 80% or 90%, that kind of range is confirming that a reasonable target for the next move up is going to be somewhere close to that wall of resistance. So at that point there, as this indicator starts to get close to this level right here, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't go for the greedy target. I mean, that's kind of expecting a, a rep. I mean, yes, we could very well move up to that point or even higher. And in a, in a uranium bull market, it would not surprise me at all if this indicator goes off up to, I don't know, 100, 120, 150% above the moving average. But just being reasonable about it and not being too greedy, it's just interesting that when you do that technique, it just pauses at this wall of resistance here that we've identified. Yes. So it's a way of, it's a way of, just not getting carried away with yourself. It's a way of not, you know, getting getting carried away with all of the euphoria that's going on at the time. Imagine, Ke Kevin, the FOMO, guys, you know how crazy it's going to be if URA goes to $45? Our accounts are going to be blowing up. It's going to be bonkers. This is going to be like silver squeeze all over again. If the price goes all the way up there, it's going to yeah. be nonsense. It, We're going to start it, believing our own hype. You know, and, and, also, and, and also, you're also you're not capturing the... Um, the the 0708 peak through URA. Uh, well, you could right? put yes. the chemical CCJ yes. there. Yeah, yeah, CCJ is a so yeah, CCJ obviously has more uh, price. So, so you would you would presume that the moving average, the deviation from the moving average, would be even more extreme if you actually had that data, which, which is what you're looking at there at CCJ. Yeah. CCJ two hundred percent above the moving average. Again, yeah. with this one, it might be reasonable to expect the yeah. next stopping off point to be somewhere around about here, which is let's call it 100% or just above 100%. So again, take your measuring tool, measure 100%. Where does it end up at? <laughs> the previous highs. Yes. So it's, yes. it's confirming for you that that is where you're likely to pause 
uh, and quite possibly pull back before a further run to the upside. So again, it's allowing you to not get carried away with the euphoria. It reminds you that there's a wall of resistance there, both on the distance from moving average as well as the price chart itself. And it, it's amazing, nine times out of 10, when you do this exercise, you'll find that your calculation for your distance from moving average peak that you can expect on the next move up coincides with something like that, either the previous highs a wall of resistance, something on the price chart. So it's just giving you that added confidence. And again, we can see clear um, bullish indications from the ratio versus the SPX that this is just embarking on a new bull run. You can see the, the cyclical. Yes. That, uh, that strikes a chord with Annie there, right? I'm wondering, Casper, I'm curious to see how you how you set your profit uh, targets there. I wanted, I'd love to hear how you do it. Yeah, I can I can show that quickly. I was just gonna yeah. say that I have a daughter that ha that has become a bit sick here, so I have to leave you guys in a few minutes. But oh. I, I can I can do that easily here, because mostly what I do is I work on the logarithmic scale. Um, I find that to be a lot more uh, a lot more clean. I would say it, it takes out a bit of the noise um, when you uh, the log scale. Yeah, yeah, using the log scale. Yeah, yeah, I think it's a bit more the the triggers are a bit more it, it, precise. It captures when it more. It captures more of the downside, like. Yeah you're able to see more downside potential through a log scale representation. It should always be log scale. Andy, mm -hmm. stop using linear. Yeah. <laughs> Whenever I say well, these charts. But from I a mathematical linear. point of view, if, if it's changed by an order of magnitude, yeah. you must use the log yeah. scale. So if you've moved from single figures to tens of <clears> numbers <throat> or from tens to hundreds or hundreds to thousands, then it really does have to be, from a mathematical point of view, it does have to be a log scale because um, although the horizontal lines make no difference what scale you're on, as soon as you start putting an inclined line, then that won't really make any sense unless it's on a log scale, if the price has moved logarithmically. Yeah, I totally like, agree. Like, uh, like, like coming with shared dilution and stuff, like if you look at UUU over time, like it's just a complete like reverse hockey stick, right? Because yeah. it's been so diluted. Exactly. Yeah, but just to, yeah, getting back to, uh, you know, URA, I just cleaned up my charts here for URA. And uh, what I have found to be really useful is actually just the 100% measured move. Uh, and what I see in the URA is is, is, is quite simple. Uh, just as uh, Patrick and, and Kevin talked about just here, we had the major blow off to the downside, and then we started a major rally up. And, and, and in technical analysis, that is typically a, a large flag pole. Then we had this pennant flag here. So usually when I, if we get there, of course, I'm not, I don't know what will happen in the future, but I will very often do the 100% the measured move, measured move uh, yeah. to the 100%, which is, you know, just below the uh, Fukushima oh. gap up there. So again, I wouldn't be surprised to, to if we hit that and then we overshoot closing that gap. Um, th this gap has such historic uh, amplitude that I'm, I'm quite confident that when and if we get there, that would be um, a major top for this for this cycle up here uh, for the next two to three years and then we will we will obviously obviously see what happens but when and if we get there i, I personally will be taking tons of profit at that point in time and then yeah, see what uh, happens so a, a really good thing to say at this point actually is don't get don't ever get hung up on just using one technique for estimating time no, no, so no. If, you can, if you can use a hundred different techniques okay that's going to take you a long time but let's say 10 if you can use 10 different techniques measured moves fibonacci you know, distance from moving average, rate of change, all of these things, they'll all give you a different, slightly different target. But what you're looking for um, from an evidential point of view is where are they clustering around? All of those targets, where are they clustering around? What sort of range of figures are you looking at? And having that information at your fingertips, it's like trying to pinpoint the direction of a, of a hurricane as it moves, um, you know, to, uh, along the Gulf Coast and you try to work out which coastal um, community it's going to hit, you have to constantly remodel and reanalyze and reestimate the path of that hurricane. And that's what you're doing here by estimating targets and using different techniques. You're estimating the point at which the hurricane is going to hit. And it's just a, a range of estimations. But when all of those estimations come in at a similar number, then you can have confidence. And technical chart analysis, actually a large part of it, is knowing what your confidence levels are. You can make a play with a low level of confidence with not very much evidence. 
but if you manage to build up a lot of evidence to support your 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 um, projected move, then the fact that you've got high degree of confidence means that you can take a higher nav risk, and taking a higher nav risk means you can make you know bigger gains and bigger profits, of course. So a lot of a lot of what we're doing here it's about knowing what your confidence levels are. It's recognizing and analyzing your confidence levels. I, I, yeah. One thing I like to do personally is uh, just like juxtapose a linear regression line, um, whether it be on a linear scale scale or a log scale. And then you look at the R square value of that regression line. And if it's tightly correlated, like if you have like a 0.7 or a 0.8 or, or, or above, um, then, you know, I I feel comfortable enough. I feel, I feel confident enough to go with that with that scale, whether it be linear or log. Um, is, is that something that you guys also look into, like just to make sure that they're like the strength of the trend, um, kind of like corresponding that to the correlation coefficient of a linear regression line? Can I just show you something before we go down that yeah. road? Because I have to leave here in two seconds. Uh, just uh, what uh, what Kevin was saying, also using multiples analysis tools to, to time your entry or your exit. And uh, this is what we're looking at here is the URA divided by the uranium spot price. And uh, if you scroll back and look at what Kevin showed you, the breakout and the retest back in 2020, actually the, the, the retest of that uh, falling wedge uh, on the URA is actually the breakout exactly here mm -hmm. in this ratio. And that was the confirmation for me to go, okay, this is it. The retest on that URA chart and the breakout here versus the uh, versus the spot price, that was my trigger to, to go along. And... Uh, the way I see this ratio playing out for over, maybe play, uh, to be played out over the next three, four years um, is that we have this major inverted head and shoulders. Again, we need to have it confirmed to get up to the neckline before we can say, all right, it is. But to me, it looks like that that is what could be forming here. And yeah. uh, So what you're saying there is that the uranium miners are turning the corner in terms of outperformance over the metal, which is what yeah. you need and what you want in a bull market. True, I mean, the, true. the underlying metal shouldn't be rising at a faster rate than the you know the, the miners that get the stuff out of the ground because they should be leveraging the yeah. um the gains in the spot price of the metal yeah exactly exactly yeah. so this was just a a second confirmation for me and then as you mentioned you can have three or four a hundred might be too big but but you know having more validations of your of your uh of your thoughts is uh, always get more pictures into the puzzles and then you can have your your uh your entry that's how that's how i do think so that, and that's what that's why your summaries on uh, on twitter are very useful casper because what you're doing there is you're bringing together all of the evidence as seen by a whole range of different twitter contributors yeah. Yeah. So that kind of collaborative work is really good because it, it it helps to give added levels of confidence if all of the technical chart analysts out there are saying something similar then it's likely that it's um it, it's likely to be true but if there's more disagreement then it shows that there's more um a greater range of possibilities so you know that that kind of thing that you're doing there by bringing together everybody's work is is good yeah thank you yeah so we've I, been looking I at will, I, i'll have oh. to leave you guys now because yeah. my daughter's getting sick so i will uh, thank you for being in it was uh, a big uh, moment in time for me to talk to you guys uh, again it, it's been some time uh, with kevin and patrick that, that's like two or three years ago but uh, yeah, thank you for for allowing me to to, to be a part of this, and uh, I hope you will keep uh, talking after after I leave you guys. So uh, yes. yeah. You. Okay, Casper, you go and yeah. take take care of your daughter. It's more important. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Have a great Thanks, day, Casper. Cheers. Cheers. Bye. -bye. Bye. So uh, we've been looking at charts the entire episode. Is is technical analysis enough though to you know? To, to make any ascertainment, like what about fundamental analysis, right? What about dividends? What about earnings? What about PE ratios? Do you guys incorporate any fundamental analysis in your work? Who we'll wants to go first? <laughs> I can go I first. Let's, let's go with Andy. Yeah. I can go first. Uh, well, here's the problem with commodity companies. Um, fundamentals change based off of the price of the commodity. So if, if you want to be successful in the commodity space, um, I think there's a couple of things that you need to know. You need to know where are your cost curves at? What's the break even points of the companies? Just kind of high level. Uh, and then if you're if the price is below the, the higher cost producers of those of the higher end of the cost curves, at some point it has to go higher. The question is is when. Uh, so the technicals will give you what the when. Uh, the cost curves will give you the the at least soft bottom area where you, you start to get bullish on it. 
And then the fundamentals will follow the commodity price. And, and I think a lot of people, what they get wrong, uh, if you're a complete fundamental investor in the commodity space, at least, because we all, I think we all think that commodities are going to do well, is they look at the current balance sheet at the bottom of a commodity bull market. And they're like, this company is like bankrupt, like it's done. <laughs> like It looks like garbage. Um, and I'm like, yeah, pretty much. That's why we're buying it. <laughs> so then when it when the price comes up and commodity is the most important thing uh, for a commodity company, that's the price of the commodity, the thing that they sell. Um, when it comes above those higher cost producers and it goes above the cost curves, the fundamentals will follow the price of the commodity. So you can look at the fundamentals, but I don't know what you're going to gain necessarily with the current state fundamentals. So what I what I tell a lot of people is we're not buying the company for today. We're buying the company for the future fundamentals of this company. Uh, if the price were to be some uh, number out in the future, what do the fundamentals of the company look like? Uh, so when you invest in commodity bull markets, what I'll say is you have to have a bullish mindset. You have to actually think the commodity price is going to go up. The fundamentals are going to are going to keep up with the the commodity price, and those fundamentals will reflect. Uh, in the future, your future thoughts. And I know there's risk in that. And that's why some people completely avoid commodities because the, the companies don't control the selling price of what they sell, like Apple does and all these others. So they can change the price. And then you can look at the fundamentals and you can say, oh, this company's got a 20% return on equity. But if you're in a commodity company, you can't do that because you're gonna be buying it when the fundamentals look pretty crappy. But what does the fundamentals look like at oil at 100? Or 150. If you're a big, you know, commodity bull market bull on oil, what does it look like at 200? And I know people are going to say, well, 200, that's totally off the page. It's like, I wouldn't say that 200 or 200 plus is off the page. Now, if you look at the return on equities at those prices in, out in the future, you're going, well, crap, this is like a thousand percent return on equity. And it's like, okay, well, and that's the whole, that's the whole opportunity. That's the only reason we put up with all this volatility and crap in commodities is because the returns change with the price of the commodity. And if you're a, a very big bull in commodity, the returns can happen. I'll just say it like this. Decades of returns in tech stocks can happen in years in commodities. And that's why I want to be here. Because you can shorten that that time frame of the return on equity and the returns um, that you can get in commodities. So I'm a hybrid investor is, is what I call it. Uh, I look at the fundamentals of the sector because you have to nail the commodity itself. That's the most important thing. If you can nail the commodity, the equities will follow and, and the fundamentals will follow uh, as well. So that's my take. And your entry points, I completely agree with technical analysis, but you need to know where your cost curves are at. Because if you know where the cost curves are at, it's like cheating if you're buying the physical metal. like. If your cost curves, the upper cost curves of silver, they're in the they're in the low to mid twenties right now, and where's the price of silver? Well, it's in the low twenties. And and if you take a long enough time frame, if you hedge yourself with time, you and and we let's say we get a downward draft into like eighteen nineteen dollars. Well, you can buy with conviction there as much as you want, and in my opinion, you will see a gain in that because you're cutting off a good portion of the high cost producers at that price. The price has to go higher for more supply to come on at some point. The question of course is when. So I, I play all of those different techniques. I play the physical metals. Uh, we saw pricing down at six, $700 in 2020 bottom for platinum. The price cannot stay there, period. They are giving you free money. The cost curves are up at eight or $900. So if, if it's up at eight or $900, buy as much as you can. And people are gonna say, oh, well, it could go lower. For a, for a period of time, yes, but for a, a two-year time frame or three-year time frame, it cannot stay down here forever. Uh, same with silver. When it went to $12, you can't even buy it for 12 at least the physical metal, uh, at the bottom of 2020. Um, but it can't stay down. You're below the cost curve. So it's kind of like cheating to some degree if you know where the cost curves are at uh, and you buy the physical metal with no risk. Uh, and then there is risk when you buy companies and equities because they could have debt. If they have debt, they could go bankrupt. Uh, that's your risk at the bottom end of it. So uh, th that's what I'll say there. It's it's yes, you know, the fundamentals of the commodity itself. And, and then the fundamentals will follow the equities fundamentals will follow the price of the commodity as it goes up. Uh, and then you have to basically look at the fundamentals of a future state 
of where you think the price could potentially go. That's the way I would view it. Gotcha. Uh, Patrick, I know you're chomping at the bit there. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, I always love hearing anybody, even if uh, Andy is not doing 100% fundamentals, how they attack it, how's your edge? Because I want to learn. I want to see, okay, am I missing something by not doing fundamentals? And no, I'm not discrediting what Andy said, but everything, every single thing he told me about anything that has nothing to do with the price chart, I will see in the price chart. I have a great example. I forget who it is. Uh, maybe I think it was Doug Casey. His biggest winner in the 2000 bull run for in the miners was a fraudulent company that was breaking out, that the capital flows were going in. Are we, do we want to make money or do we want to be right that the fundamentals that we think for that company because we like Sprott, we like this guy. I could go to sleep at night because I have confidence in that guy who's running that company. I like the management. Look, who knows? Maybe the guy's going to run off with his secretary. He has a cocaine problem and the company implodes. All, all this stuff, the market participants will figure it out and they will- You're talking from experience, it. it sounds like, Patrick. Well- That's an, that's an analogy he uses a lot, <laughs> I'm just saying. What? Uh, like, I'm not going to go down that road, guys, unless we, we, do a, we do a session on our backstories. But <laughs> what I'm trying to say is Different market episode. participants will figure out, will give you in the chart. If a chart's breaking out and the price is trending upwards, Seriously, I don't care. Look, I want a high, I like high cap stocks because of the liquidity. I'm able to go in and out and get the price I want. People like the, those crappy, the small minor stocks, but if there's illiquid, you know, you got to deal with that issue. But the charts will see everything. And for fundamentals, if I could chart a fundamental, I will use it. We, we, we chart uh, charts with their dividend adjusted charts. So we do use a fundamental metric, but I have a chart. So I have a price chart minus the dividends given out to the shareholders and I have, I have a chart. I could do TA on it. And the TA actually gives me scientific probability. I could, ass I could assign probabilities to that move. If I have a dividend paying company who's getting out 10, 20% dividend and its chart is breaking out. And then my nominal chart, my non-dividend adjusted chart is breaking out. Holy Moses. I, I, I just said I have a double whammy there. And if I see dividend adjusted charts, so I'm breaking down then that's going to give me, oh boy, even a dividend adjusted version is breaking down. I, I might, you know, so if I could chart a fundamental, I'll use it. If I can't chart it, if I can't do technical analysis on it, for me, it's just uh, it's just noise and a waste of time. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Whoever's watching there quick. that wanted me to say Which something else. Be... Andy, did you I, want to respond really quick? I agree with you, really Patrick, quick? though. The way that I'll, I'll, I say that I look is I actually scroll through charts. I look at the fractals or the size of the moves and then I'll say, yep, yeah, this looks good. And then I go check the fundamentals of okay. the company. Okay. So I screen using technical analysis, but then I use the fundamentals to say, does the story match the actual move? Yeah. Like uh, it could be process. a Reddit squeeze for all we know or something like that. And I'm like, eh, I'm not interested in this one. It's too much risk in terms of the reason that it went up. Uh, but if it's a company that's growing and I look and I say, oh crap, this, this oil company, they're going to grow production by, you know, 3x in a three-year time frame it's a smaller company you've got this big fractal uh in the chart and i'm going oh crap that looks good what's going on with the company oh crap they're making money they're reinvesting they're doing this out in the future they're buying back shares it's like i want to see the alignment of all these things come into play i want the technicals because usually the technicals um are really good on a really good company generally speaking and if you get at that match like you got good technicals good fractals big patterns you got this big basing pattern that just broke. The fundamentals look good. I'm like, well, this is where I'm going to put a bunch of money. And, and that's how I look at it. Yeah. So I do the background check uh, of the fundamentals of the company. The fundamentals are, you know, um, what, what what's the production of it? You know, what are they producing? Uh, what's the mix? What does the commodity look like? If it's a natural gas company, what's natural gas doing? How are they growing production? What's their plan? And I just take a quick look at it to look at their presentations and read through their presentation real quick. Um, there's other setups too that you can look at uh, that maybe you're not familiar with. And then you go and you look at the presentation like, no, no, it seems like it's a fraudulent company or something. And then you might skip that out. Like Bri so, Brie X? How, how many percent moved the Brie X do with there in the 2000s there or in the 80s? I, well, remember that story, Brie X? It was a fraudulent, I think even a Quebec company there that was a... Uh... I, I'll, I'll be honest. I probably would never, if if I saw the tech, like the fundamentals and it was a fraudulent company, I probably wouldn't buy it. I, but I, how would, would you know it's fraudulent. fraudulent? Don't the market participants know? The, 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 the insiders know. And you'll see in the chart because the, the secretary who's seeing the footnotes of their meetings and or the accountant, one day he's going to talk. 
He's going to tell his wife, hey, by the way, man, it's not looking good. And then it's going to crack. And then the price might stall, start falling. It's like that FTX thing. People say, oh, it was by surprise FTX crashed. Man, I looked at the chart. Man, there was warning signs. That thing was, the momentum was slowing down. There was no reason to be FTX a year before that thing crashed. Just like Binance today, they're, they're all on the verge. So I, I just think people, the market's smarter than me. A secretary is going to talk. A president's going to sell. And I'll figure it out through the price chart, whether it's a good company or not. Well, on that point, but, talking about cryptocurrencies, okay, fundamentals. Okay, just veering off at a bit of a tangent here away from commodities. The, the fundamental case for Bitcoin is as good now as it was two years ago, 18 months ago. OK, you know, probably better, you know, all this talk about ETFs and all the rest of it. The fundamental reasons for Bitcoin doing well are as strong or stronger now than they were 18 months ago. And yeah, of course, we've fallen from whatever it was, 69,000 down to less than half of that. So if the fundamentals are, you know, going to determine whether or not you get into X, Y or Z, then uh, that's not really... I'm a scientist, look, I need evidence. I don't give a rat's ass about, you know, what someone says about a company. I don't care about their figures because the figures can be cooked, okay? You, you read company, um, you know, financial accounts all the time, you know, you hear about them being being rigged and false, false accounting and all that kind of stuff. I'm not interested in anybody's fairy stories. All I'm interested in is the evidence. And the evidence for me comes from the price chart because the price chart is made up of all of the market participants, that the price chart knows more than I could ever know as an investor, because it's reflecting the actions of hedge funds, small investors, you know, medium investor, large investing organizations, ETFs, whatever the hell's buying the stock. It's all reflected in that price chart. So as the price chart breaks out, it's telling you something. As it back tests, it's telling you something. As it goes to a capitulation low and leaves that wick on the candle, it's telling you something. When it breaks down below support, below the Ichimoku cloud, below a horizontal support line, it's telling you everything you need to know. I'm not going to make money on a fundamental case for what somebody's told me about, you know, a mining company or a crypto. I'm going to make money on the price movement. So I'm going to analyze the price movement, the momentum behind that price movement, the evidence behind it, how it's performing versus other other stocks, other sectors the ratio charts that's going to tell me everything i need to know as a scientist doing a scientific analysis on that stock and on the price on the momentum on the markets around it tells you everything you need to know about whether you should be taking a position in that stock or not but to, for me anyway as a having a scientific background the fundamentals are flawed in the respect that they can be warped by human actions the price is all that matters because that is what's going to determine whether you make a, a gain or a loss Fundamentals, even if you're talking about the accounts and the numbers and how many ounces they say they're pulling out of the ground, I don't know if that's true. You're only taking somebody's word for that. So stories are good. You know, I know having an overall awareness of the market is good. I can I can totally get that. Having an overall awareness of the situation around a company or the management, it's it's always. It's, I'm not saying it's not interesting or useful. It can be, but to me, it's, it's more susceptible to being flawed. And that's what that's what I would say about it. But is it risk inherent in every bet though? So naturally, like I don't like I don't think Andy just going all in on one thing or like a small handful of things just because of fundamental analysis. I think because I'm I'm kind of this in the same mold there. I kind of use like it's fundamental analysis is kind of like a filtration process, right? It's not just I'm just using so, fundamental analysis, but I'm also looking at TA. And, you know, you're just yeah. putting like a small percentage of allocation throughout these these companies. You so about now, risk, you risk, how much you're risking in each oh. trade. Sorry, so when, when I view risk, and I, I understand what Kevin's saying and Pat's saying, and I agree, I use technical analysis to, to vet what I'm looking yeah. at. But if you look under the hood and you say, look, this company doesn't have, they're not making any money. And, and whenever that's the case, I just think more risk. There's more risk of whatever to happen. If they don't make any cash flow, they don't make any money. Uh, like, for instance, and here's my opinion, uranium companies, the majority of uranium companies are inherently more risky than oil companies because they don't make any money. So you've got risk of dilution, risk of 
uh, things happening like a mine because they don't they could be a single producer with a single mine. That's risky because it's if one thing happens to that one mine, it, it's risk. That's how I perceive it. So you're looking at the what I consider to be the fundamentals of the company. I look at it and say, crap, they've got one mine. I, I can't bet. I can't put a, a large percentage of, of a position on this. But if I look at an oil company, uh, they've got infrastructure in place. Their market cap's 170 million. They were generating four billion in cash flow back last bull market, and I'm going crap. They have the infrastructure to generate four billion of cash flow at this price. And then I look at the chart pattern because it came back down. I'm going well, crap. This is a pretty good bet. Uh, and then I look at their debt, and I'm like, ah, they'll make, they'll make through it. You know, they'll make it through. And then I decide to put a larger position on. Uh, that company because the technicals look good, but also they've got cash flowing infrastructure where cash can get back to me. And the company, if it's a cash flowing company and it's not fraudulent or anything like that, uh, they can change their destiny to some degree. They can buy back shares. They can uh, give back dividends. They can they can adjust things. Now, it's still going to be seen in the technicals. Totally agree. I, I'm not debating uh, that, but I just do a little quick fundamental check saying, is it a cash flow company or not? Do they, do, is it a single mine or a single field or a single anything? And I just view that as, as a riskier bet. And that, that's what I do. I'm not saying that, that anybody else has to do that, but. No, absolutely. There's one sort of um, nuance to that. And is that that's this in, in a bull market. Okay. Like a uranium bull market, for example, the risk is not the same as in a, a topping formation or a pullback formation or a, a bear, a bear market. So what I'm saying is that the the, the crappy companies will um, do as well, or even better in terms of percentage gains, the tiny micro cap crappy companies that never produce anything, for example, explorers or whatever. They're historically the ones that make huge, huge gains in a in a in a bull market. And I agree with you, Andy. The risk is higher from the point of view of you know fundamental analysis of the company. And yet, you know, it comes down to that, that old adage that, you know, um, rising tide sort of lifts all boats or there's a vol more vulgar version of that. <laughs> um, but you know what I mean? So in, in a bull market, you know, the stuff that it, you might perceive as risky very often are the ones that make the greatest gains, uh, kind of like the pump and dump sort of scenario. But um, I, I, I can say exactly what you're saying. I don't disagree with it, but it's maybe just the way my brain is is wired up as a, as a scientist to like, I need the evidence kind of, kind of thing. The, the way we're able to add more, put more, more risk or risk more of our nav on a trade is like, if you look at the, my back screen here, I have it, you see the stars. There's like a, Kevin mentioned a cluster uh, evidence cluster. So the charts, not all charts are made the same, like a descending wedge, like the, the huge triangles, like Andy was showing that, that first breakout is it's, it's a, it's a breakout of that downwards momentum. But for us, that's a very that's a lower probability of reaching the top top target in one shot. It's a it's a low much lower probability. We've played a lot of those, and practically none of them re reach their implied measure move. They go up and then they stagnate and then they create. That's, a that's actually over over Patrick's uh, left shoulder at the moment. You can see that little star on the chart there. The point. There's a de there's a declining trend line. It's the gold chart, and that's where you get the first breakout. We we award it a star. Okay. It's it's a, it's a move above the what we call a wake up line. You then have another four pieces of evidence that we look for. And as you gather each of those pieces of evidence, we award another star for each piece of evidence. And only when you get that sort of fifth star is the evidence cluster complete. Yes. Actually, it's got a gold chart. Well, here. Because I'll, I'll show you a quick example there. And We're this goes back to what I was saying before. It's a question of confidence. It, it's all about knowing when to be confident. Okay about the being in a bull market look at that so that's clear that's clearly a bear market so patrick's going to show you now how do i know when to have confidence in this you can you can take a, a low confidence position anytime there. you want see a there lot of people would have played this i, I in a nutshell like th probably a lot of maybe fundamentals say it's not ready yet but this was a break from a descending trend line but that's rarely the one that's going to go all the way up here. What usually happens, it, it just goes side, it goes up. Unless you want to play this as a trade, what's probably going to happen is going to go like this, and it's going to go. I don't have the great, the best. It, it tends to find moment. some upper. It's going to do something like this there, yeah. and yeah. and and then after that, then after that is going to, you know, it's going to do something like that. 
It takes time. So here, if somebody would play this, we'd risk a quarter of a percent of our NAB, a quarter of a percent, if we decided to, to gamble it away. Because it's only got one star. But not yeah. our charts are made equal here. Let's say when I get my breakout out of this huge base, I'm going to risk 2% of my NAV, you know? And then I'll I'll be I'll be more greedy and I'll start I'll start raising more because I know that the probabilities of like the thousands of charts we've looked at and the ones that we've played at different various moments, the probabilities are that this is the this is the move to play. This is the higher probability move to play. So I'm I'm curious Andy, one day we're probably going to have to do this exercise together is I'm going to, you're going to tell me the fundamental, like, let's, you could tell me a company that's, you think that has great fundamentals and I'm pretty sure, or any, name me, like you could have a good company, bad company, medium company fundamentals. I'll look at the charts and I have a feeling that the ones that you're really praising high on the fundamental size, the charts probably, it's probably a, a very aggressive bullish pennant. Like it's not a drooping down, you know, the like Cameco, Boss Energy, those things broke out five, six months ago ahead ahead of the crappy stuff, right? Because those are probably, I don't know what your thoughts are on the fundamentals of Cameco, but the, the market- You're muted, Andy. Uh, yeah, I know. Um, so I, Cameco, I'm not a huge fan of, but uh, uh, the reason is I think their their minds are not that great. They have flooding issues and stuff like that. So um, I would rather actually, if I consider just as risky as some of these other companies, wow. which can be high risky. And I think there's more returns. So I'd rather just take the risk uh, and go into some of these developers in uranium. But the chart, uh, the chart's better looking uranium. though. But what's that? If you have a better looking chart on Cameco, it's just better. It's a higher probability. If I tell you that chart has an 80% chance of reaching its measured move instead of another chart, which has, according to our, our, our stats, has a 70% chance of reaching its move. Which one do you rather? No, so what I do is I'll look at Camco as a leader of the group, uh, and then I'll look at the laggards that are still down to get a better asymmetry uh, entry point. Uh, and if there's a lot less downside and something that's lagging behind it, then I'll I'll take the the one that's down because I think the risks in Camco are still high. Uh, they're having problems, you know, fundamentally all over the place, and they could still go up. Uh, I just think that it won't be as good. What about Boss Energy? Boss Energy is still risky, though. Um, there's still a lot of risk there. I've got my kid just walked in. <laughs> Hi. It's like my kid. Let me, let me put him outside. <laughs> it's it reminds me when my, my, my kids show up there or my cat shows up in the middle of a... Yeah. I, I had my cat show up on uh, one, one of my videos before. Um, well, well, either way, I have a question specifically for, for Kevin there. Um, I want to take advantage of your... You said meteorological background? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so... What are we seeing this winter? Like for us, natural gas and coal investors, like, I, I don't know if you like monitor the, the, the models or the models or anything, but like, are we looking towards a colder winter or warmer winter? Funny, it's a question I get asked quite a lot. And uh, as a, as an ex meteorologist, I tend to not uh, look too much at uh, sort of long-term weather forecasts at the moment. I'm focusing all of my time and energy on, uh, technical price charts so I, can't, I can't really answer that one thing i can say though with some knowledge is that the oceans around uh, the world are considerably warmer than they should be or have historically been this time of year and that usually means quite an active um hurricane season um, and it gives more energy into the transatlantic storms that cross from the united states to where i am in the uk thank you very much guys for sending all your, your crappy weather over here but um Warmer oceans tend to mean more more vigorous storms and, and hurricanes as well. So that's one thing to watch out for over the next month or two on the uh, on the Gulf Coast. In terms of the uh, severity of the, the winter over North America and Canada, I'll be honest, I haven't really uh, looked at the indications yet. Gotcha. Worth a try. Um, <laughs> so I, I know natural gas is in the dumps at the moment and uh, yeah. any sign of a cold winter and that thing's going to fly probably, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I'm... You're, you're you're the first meteorologist I've ever had on the show, so you know it'd just be it'd worth be asking the question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we're an hour and forty five minutes in. Um, wow. I think we've covered a lot of ground. Uh, how about we save some material for next time, guys? Absolutely, yeah. good idea. Yeah. yeah. So it's bonkers. It's time yeah, before we sign off. Let's just go around really quick. Uh, where can people find you? And any uh, closing thoughts? 
Let's do Patrick. Yeah, well, for, for me, it's um, or, at, or, at, yeah, North Star Ch- at North Star Charts on Twitter. Uh, so you can get me at North Star Charts. We've also got a, a YouTube channel, um, North Star Bad Charts, and uh, NorthStarBadCharts.com is the is the website, of course. So um, that's where you can find me. Okay. Uh, Patrick? Same as Kevin, Bad Charts 1 on Twitter. And uh, before we sign off, Andy and uh, Casper, when uh, if you ever when he watches that there, I'm uh, always super happy there to to pick your brains and uh, always it's always about gathering evidence, always trying to to find uh, different ways to increase our probabilities, lower our risk there, like like, like you told us, Danny. And uh, that's it, guys. Thanks for everybody who watched all of this there. Hope you you found value in this. Yeah. Well, we do have Mister Finding Value, Andy. <laughs> I really enjoy doing this. I really uh, like talking back and forth. Uh, I think there's a lot of things that we probably agree on more than we disagree on, to be honest. Um, and we might just fine tune our our things uh, a little bit different. But um, yeah, you can find me at Finding Value Finance, uh, the YouTube channel or the website, finding-value.com. And uh, yeah, I, I really enjoyed this. So yeah, I think we should do it again. And we can we can take things that are vastly different, uh, like different topics or whatever that we do disagree on. I don't know how much we disagree on, to be honest. But um, but yeah, it'd be we fun can, to, get to, one of us to play devil's uh, devil's advocate. And, uh, one of us can come in here and uh, pretend to be a real disbeliever of technical analysis. I'm gonna throw it out there. If anybody's watching this and you think you, you'd like to be to you you have a up. solid case to convince me to use fundamentals, because that's the argument. Like you know, I don't mind. Uh, Talking about Bitcoin, people saying open challenge, a, open challenge. Anybody, anybody, you could be a superstar in the fintwit or not a superstar. I don't care if like we have to open this debate. And I think that this idea of having panels is great to instead of like one-on-one interviews, which are good, but ho- hopefully try to garner some some debate and uh, so people could figure out uh, what strikes a chord with them the best there. Yeah, this is a really fun collab. Um, and I like the fact we weren't just, again, I was just agreeing with each other, you know, throughout the entire thing. Um, with that said, everybody, if you enjoyed this kind of content, go ahead and like, subscribe, do all the YouTube stuff I'm supposed to tell you to do. Uh, we'll try to do more of these collabs in the future. So with that said, I will see you in the next episode. Bye, y'all. Yeah, that's I right. Got you. Go ahead and flex. <laughs>